You're listening to The Recovered Life Show, the show that helps people in recovery live their best recovered lives. And here is your host, Damon Frank. And welcome back to The Recovered Life Show. I have guest Emily Sussman on the line. She is an addiction and recovery psychotherapist and coach, and we're talking about understanding sex addiction today. Welcome to the show, Emily. Thank you so much. I am so glad to have you on today. A lot of questions about sex addiction. People don't understand it. There's a lot of people that, you know, come into the whole recovery process through drug and alcohol issues. They get sober. They start to learn about sex addiction, wondering if they might have issues with sex addiction. So let's dive into this. You're a psychotherapist. You're also a coach. You deal with people who have alcohol and drug addictions. Uh, you're in recovery yourself. And um, yeah. I always love hearing from people who are on kind of the therapist side and also have gone through a recovery process before because I think it brings another dimension. Tell us a little bit about this whole sex addiction thing. What What is sex addiction? Emily, because people say, oh, you like sex, you must be a sex addict. That's not necessarily true, right? What What is sex addiction? So um, the primary characteristic of any addiction is loss of control, right? And we don't normally think of loss of control as a good thing, right? It usually Loss of control implies and, and really means that destructive consequences are happening in our lives because we are engaging in this behavior or substance to an extent that we don't get to say it anymore. It's not just limited to Saturday nights or, you know, Monday afternoons or parties or whatever. We are doing it in a way that is increasingly frequent and needing, um, you know, increasing intensity really of the behavior in order to get the same effect. So absolutely, I deal with not just substance addictions, but a lot of different types of sexual addiction, um, everything from pornography addiction to voyeurism um, to exhibitionism. Um, and I also do a lot of work with um, gambling addicts too. Um, but really, at, at its core, every addiction is the same. It is an escape from looking and feeling oneself as we really are. Um, and it is, yeah, it's it's this escape from reality. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because I, I, I when I first got into a 12-step program um, and got sober and went through that whole process, things like food addiction sex addiction, a little bit of gambling, but 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 not much, right? It was never really talked about. Like the, the bigger mental health issue of it, it was much more about you're taking the substance, you have to stop taking the substance, and then after there's a bunch of other things that are going to happen and you're going to be better, right? Like that that was what, I, I know it's an immature takeaway, but that's what I got out of it, you know? Sure. And, but in a way that, that, that was kind of the, that was kind of the focus of of recovery now recovery has changed a lot and it's become more encompassing it's become more of a mental health issue because you know i know when i look back at my own addiction i was addicted as a child to escapism then i was addicted to sugar and then i became an alcoholic right it was a, it yep. was a it was a step now i think a lot of people emily they're getting into recovery and they might have a weird relationship with sex and maybe they feel that it is addictive. What are some of the signs that maybe it's like, no, this is maybe a more of a problem than you think it is with sex yeah. addiction? So it's really interesting because a lot of people have the assumption that a sex addiction is sort of this compulsive need to get close to other people or to form relationships, you know, um, through sex. But in actuality, People who engage in compulsive sexual behaviors would rather do anything but get close to people, right? This is not, 
an attempt to connect intimately with a partner. This is an attempt to validate yourself maybe with, you know, seductive behavior and then the fulfillment of, you know, sex afterwards. Um, or like we just talked about a minute ago, um, you know, the need to escape one's own feelings and real self, right? But at the end of the day, it's it's a step, it's it's an attempt to get away from intimate relationships. It's not a step towards intimate relationships. And in that way, it's really common with other addictions too. Um, you know, uh, the typical alcoholic is not comfortable with intimacy, right? Um, they want to connect over alcohol, you know, which of course is not the authentic self. Um yeah, I was thinking, you know, originally when you think about like in a recovery sense, when you think about recovering from addiction later on in that journey, typically you're talking about kind of what, you know, we call emotional sobriety, you know, yep. uh, intimacy, I, I, I think is, is, is a really big thing. And I think when people come into 12 step programs, it might've been the first time that they've actually been honest with somebody else, you know, and I, I, I look at honest friendships really of somebody like say, no, like that's not right. Or you, you know, you are doing good at this or whatever kind of feedback you might be getting from peers that's really directly honest, I, I do kind of is the the bridge to that intimacy because you can start forming relationships with people. Yes. You talked about uh you you talked about one of the issues um and one of the things symptoms of sex addiction is really participating in sex but not having intimacy is that multiple partners what, what what does it what does that look like are we talking about somebody who is just in that hookup culture constantly and not forming relationships is is, is that really what it is or is it is it more complicated than that um Absolutely. I mean, sexual behavior is such a broad category. We could be talking about people who compulsively use freely available, totally legal online pornography to an extent that it is taking time away from their job, their families, you know, sucking money, um, you know, out of their accounts because they're, you know, um, in a sort of pseudo relationship with a webcam girl, right? You know, who does sexual, you know, kind of performative stuff for them. Um, I've worked with people who, you know, I mean, the, the definition of voyeurism as a sexual compulsion is um, illegally really spying on people in order to obtain sexual gratification. So setting up video cameras and dressing rooms secretly, um, things like that. I've also worked with people who were um, serial adulterers, you know, for lack of a better word, people who um, would hop, maybe were in a seemingly perfect, you know, stable marriage, but the entire time were, um, you know, literally running out at night to go to bars to meet partners. I mean, you know, um, it's the, the net result is the same, which is it is this increasingly out of control pursuit of sexual gratification. And because human nature, you know, sexuality is on this big spectrum, different things, you know, just for lack of a better term, turn us on. That's why sexual addictions occur in so many different forms. Um, but again, so many of these behaviors aren't terrible or certainly not illegal in in isolation but it's the just like alcohol is not illegal or you know having a glass of wine isn't necessarily destructive for so many people but it is this loss of control and um, increasingly damaging consequences that makes it um, characteristic of an addiction mm -hmm. what are some of the impacts that people have from sex addiction it's pretty clear you know if you're an alcoholic and you keep drinking alcohol eventually you're going to drink to excess, have medical issues, die, be yep. institutionalized. There, there, it's, you know, we, we kind of see that in society. Yep. It, what, what are the impacts of sex addiction on people's lives? Pretty much without exception, every person I've worked with um, uh, on this issue has had a 
is involved in a marriage or relationship in which they are alienated from their partner, right? There are no intimately connected sex addicts. Um, you know, there's this sort of secret double life going on where they are, um, you know, either physically cheating on their spouse or, um, you know, again, compulsively using pornography, something like that. Um, and really, what are what is any addict doing by engaging in addictive behavior? They're escaping their true feelings, right? They're attempting to control their feelings and put themselves in this sort of trance state or you know high state, right? But the but the effect on relationships is extremely damaging. If you're not able to connect to yourself and talk about your feelings and share that stuff with a partner there's not really a relationship there. Um, so that's the biggest, um, you know, I guess, most obvious sort of symptom of um, a sexually compulsive, um, you know, disorder in, in somebody who's in a relationship. But in more general terms, I think even bigger than that or going along with that is shame, the problem of shame. Shame permeates everything we do um, when we are self-loathing because we know we have this double life, for example. Um, we're engaging in acts that we're not proud of or, you know, um, aren't socially acceptable or something like that. Um, shame alienates us not just from other people, but from ourselves. It's, um, you know, self-esteem. It's all wrapped up in this issue of shame. Um, and that has extremely damaging consequences, as you can imagine, for people's careers, relationships, family relationships, um, you know, dreams, goals, whatever. Yeah, you know, we were talking before the episode started about 12-step groups a little bit and, you um, you know, you were telling me and informing me a little bit about SA, right? Which is yeah, SAA, a group. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, it's interesting because when I look at, um, when I look at Alcoholics Anonymous and the 12 steps and all of the writing that happened, you know, shame is something that was not mentioned in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous at all. And I you know primarily because, you know, a lot of the people who wrote this were men that were coming back from the war, had seen horrible things, right? Had really, honestly, what we would consider now very rough lives, right? Yep. Had had come back. Shame is not something that people discuss. And I think a lot of the times, I could just say from an, I, you know, I, I don't know about the sex addiction side, but from the alcohol alcoholism side, shame is obvious, uh, sometimes communicated as fear, which it mm -hmm. wasn't, which it was in the big book, you know? It's communicated as fear, but really, it's shame. C can you describe what shame is, kind of? Because I think people have a misconception about actually what is shame and yeah. how it relates to this. When I think of shame, the next word that comes to my mind, or you could say the other side of the coin, um, is dishonesty. Okay, And I'll explain what I mean by that, is when we don't like who we are or what we're doing, even on this subconscious level of, hey, man, like, it's cool that I, you know, bang chicks all day. And, you know, we we think it's cool or our friends think it's cool. If we are mm -hmm. ashamed of that behavior on sort of that soul level, that subconscious level, that translates into us needing to hide from ourselves, right? And that's what I think of as shame. So how is shame connected to dishonesty? Like I said, um, we really, like we talked about earlier, we're unable to communicate our feelings or get real with people with how we actually think or how, what we actually feel. Um, it's like where shame is like a, like a, I think of it as like a big velvet curtain where we're hiding ourselves from ourselves and by extension, other people too. So, you know, when we think of shame, it's not just like someone's like, oh, I'm just wracked with shame about this. No, it's so insidious. It really, it really damages who we are as people because we're not able to show up in any relationship or in any, you know, setting, um, really when we're, you know, hiding all these different parts of ourselves. Um, yeah. For all of you Recovered Life Show listeners who've battled in sobriety and are ready to level up, 
listen up. I'm offering a week of my accountability coaching absolutely free. This isn't just about day-to-day survival. It's about aggressively propelling your life forward. Whether you're new to sobriety or have been sober for years and are struggling to elevate your life, I'm going to be your partner for a week and help you get on track and start living the recovered life you deserve. We're not just talking about setting goals here. We're going to pursue real, tangible breakthroughs in your personal and business life. This is more than recovery. It's about owning your path and seizing the greatness you're destined for. But hurry, spaces are limited. Don't wait. Go to DamonFrank.com and claim your free week and start your journey. It's time to transform survival into thriving. Visit DamonFrank.com and book your free week now. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because shame is much more, you know, the way that I look at it is the way in which I look at myself, right, too? Like the way I went, not necessarily how people look at me, the way I feel about myself deep down inside, right? And it's interesting because just being somebody in recovery and then working with other people in recovery, you know, through 12 steps or, or, or doing accountability coaching for them. I I've noticed a lot of times, Emily, is that most people in recovery have shame. I would say, you know, out of the guys who I, I primarily work with men, I would say nine of 10 have, when you get right down to it, have this thing. And a lot of the time, the shame shouldn't even be associated with them. You know, I'm thinking of one situation, you know, this person had a tremendous amount of shame. And I was like, man, this has nothing to do with you. Yeah. Like, you know, this happened to you, yes, but this is really, this is not, this happened when you were a kid. This is nothing to do with you. Yep. You don't own any of this, right? But yet, but yet it's taken on. It's interesting. How, How does this, this idea of this whole monetization of the sex culture now. And I, look, I, I see this tech, TikTok, Instagram, OnlyFans, people are monetizing sexuality. What is that doing from like a psychotherapist point of view? I'd love to hear this. What is that doing for people? Because I, I see the monetization of it is creating people who become sex addicts. Yeah, I mean, we could just sit here talking about social media addiction, you know, that's that could be a whole episode, right? But but it feeds but what you're talking about in terms of the sexualized culture and and social media channels absolutely feeds into sexually compulsive disorders. Young men in particular are really a whole population that I work with. I live near a major university and so I see a lot of men in that sort of 19 to 22, 25 range and without exception, pretty much all of them have have been addicted to pornography since the age of 12, 11, 12, 13, because they've grown up in this era where it's so readily available. And, you know, it wasn't even just, you know, they found the porn site and the way to get in it. But, you know, the, these pathways of Instagram of, like you said, TikTok, um, you know, really feed into, um, you know, these days, then you can, you're suddenly you're connected to an OnlyFans account, and then you're really into, you know, this world, um, which is why also as part of the solution in identifying for people, um, for sex addicts, what is recovery or what does sobriety look like? We don't, we can't just say, all right, we got to stay away from the porn sites. It's like for most men I work with or, or people who are addicted to pornography, even Instagram, Facebook, TikTok have to be part of their sobriety piece. Um, they've got to block themselves or take themselves out of those sites because they are so triggering again and such a pathway into, um, you know, sort of the, the meat of the, um, you know, sexual uh, culture, which is, you know, the the pornographic material. Yeah, you know, it's it's everywhere. When you look back on how alcohol was marketed, when you look back on even how cocaine was marketed through Coca-Cola, right? Like, it's yep. very, very similar. When you look at it, I was talking with a friend the other day. I was like, this is very similar. They're marketing this, right? And as yep. a marketer, I know they're like, they're marketing this. They're, they're monetizing this. And I think it's such a pat, an easy path for people because I think in general, especially post-COVID, I don't know if you've seen this, 
the willingness for people to have intimacy, and I'm not even talking sexual intimacy, I'm just talking connection with your neighbor, with like, I, I, I've noticed this, like, I don't really go to a lot of physical meetings because a lot of the physical meetings were wiped away, right? Like, the yeah, meetings people became like afraid do. of their neighbors during yes. COVID. Yeah. Yes, not this not connect. Doesn't this not connecting with people and this culture of just text messaging and everything? Doesn't that really just feed into this whole idea of not having intimacy? 100%. I mean, um, another sort of characteristic that I observe um, is um, in sex addicts is just a, they might have a ton of friends, but they're really superficial relationships, right? Um, where they just don't go deep. And, you know, I mean, we could really extend this conversation and talk about just the conditioning of men in general. Um, you know, a lot of men are not brought up to talk about feelings or to connect with other men or women over, you know, how they really feel, who they really are. Um, and, you know, addictions just sort of nurture that reluctance, you know, to the point where then we get all the shame layers, you know, then we're really hiding ourselves from people, then there really is a disconnection. Um, you know, and, and you mentioned 12 step, you know, meetings, whether virtually or in person, I happen to, you know, do in person that works for me. Um, but a lot of the people I work with who do SAA, Sex Addicts Anonymous, there's this wonderful, huge virtual fellowship. Um, there's only one meeting in my city in person, you know, for example, mm -hmm. if you can get to it, great. But for if you need a meeting every day, it's going to be virtual. Um, so for people who really want recovery and really understand that emotional connection is such a big part of the healing process, becoming more in touch with ourselves and able to show ourselves to others, um, you know, meetings are just such a huge part of that. Yeah, I know. How many percentage of people w would you say, I mean, how prevalent is this with, with alcohol and drug 12-step meetings for people to have a sex addiction, addiction issue? Because I've noticed something since doing the show a couple of years ago. We started the show around COVID, when COVID started. And what I've noticed by just talking with people with long-term sobriety, professionals, is that when people come into recovery, they tend to want to escape again because they don't have the drug of choice. Yep. So they bridge into other addictions. You know, yep. sugar is a big one. Like, you know, I, I remember having a conversation at 12 step group. It's like, you know what, how many jelly filled donuts can we have? Yeah. You know, we're, we're, it's like a type two diabetes factory in here. Right. Like maybe this isn't a good idea. Right. And I've just from my own personal experience, like service commitments, seeing people that, to, literally went out because of dating sugar they just couldn't think clearly right made a bad decision out never came back right money yeah yep. those things tend to be food right how many how many people do you see that come in with a primary addiction end up having multiple addictions Oh, I mean, universally, it's, I always think of it as a triangle. There are three primary addictions. Um, for some people, it's gambling, alcohol, cocaine. For some people, it's sex, marijuana, and, you know, video games. I mean, but usually mm -hmm. there it's, I think of it as a triangle. It's like three points on a triangle. Um, there is one maybe most destructive addiction in that triangle, which might be alcohol for some people or, you know, pornography, if it's sucking up all their time and energy. Um, um, but absolutely. And and I know what I did in my years of um, active addiction was I just rotated, right? When when things got too bad with yeah. alcohol, I'd move on to, you know, and I'd like do ecstasy for a couple of weeks and, you know, make that my, my escape. Um, you know, so there's this sort of rotation of um, addictions. But absolutely, to answer your question directly, yes, people come in with the, mo the problem of the most destructive addiction. And what we find over the course of our work together and this process of getting sober, we realize that there's so much more that needs to be included in that sobriety category in order for them to become emotionally healthy and to shed those layers of shame. And it's an ongoing process, right? It's yes. not an all or nothing, right? So what what are what are some of the differences here? Because I know people are going to ask this, they're thinking this, okay, if I if I go 
and discover that I have a sex addiction, does that mean that I can never have sex again? Because alcohol, like, I can't drink alcohol. I mean, I'm telling you, Emily, like, I can't. Like, right. other Me people neither. can. Yeah, right. Like, you and I cannot, we don't have that luxury to be able to do that. But yeah. things like food addiction, things like sex addiction, it's not as black and white, right? With, with the, like, you have to eat food. Like, we've had a lot of people that have, you know, that, that are, that have food addictions on here, that they eat food. They don't not eat food. So how does that work with sex addiction? So, um, there's a super useful tool that I learned about through the fellowship of SAA reading their green book, which is sort of their basic text. And they call it the three circles exercise, right? The outer circle, you're meant to identify those activities that build you up, that make you feel good about yourself, you know, exercise, hanging out with family, you know, things like that. Middle circle are those activities that sort of gray area, like, you know, leads you sort of on the pathway to that primary addiction, which is your inner circle, right? So when we're talking about sobriety and sex addiction, we really want to be mindful of that middle circle and the inner circle. Um, again, the, the middle circle, it could be something like Instagram, you know, sort of a, it's, you know, it's PG, right? No. Well, for a lot of people, it leads directly right into their inner circle, um, you know, activities that we need to um, absolutely maintain abstinence from. That being said, you know, I mean, we get it with alcohol, right? We just can't drink. Alcohol is that middle and inner circle, you know? But here's what happens with recovery from sexual addiction is, yes, our inner circle may be really sort of big at first, like, nope, can't look at this, can't watch triggering movies, you know, mm -hmm. can't go to these places where, you know, I might be triggered. But as people gain emotional awareness, gain the ability to be emotionally honest, gain the ability to connect with other people, and therefore are building self-love and confidence and, you know, just that ability to be intimate and to have more fulfillment in general in their lives, right? then we can start to reintroduce, you know, um, uh, other sexual behaviors, which maybe they wouldn't have been able to handle, um, you know, prior to recovery. Um, so again, it's not as it's not as clear cut as like alcohol or drugs. We're talking about um, sort of a gradual return to intimacy, which can include se healthy sexuality. Mm. Okay. And what about people who have somebody in their life that they've identified might have a problem with sex addiction. Um, you know, what do they do? How, how do they approach it? Because I think, you know, even in prepping for this, th this podcast, I wasn't very versed on this. I have to be honest, like, sure. and I'm so glad that you're coming in and talking about this with us, because I think talking about this, especially to people who are in 12 step groups, who might not have this, right? It's like therapy too. Like we do a lot of things about therapy, the benefit of therapy. It's really misunderstood. Medication is yes. really misunderstood. There's a lot of misunderstandings with this. And I think people are very terrified of this topic. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm gonna be I'm gonna be honest with you because even oh, me totally. doing this show, I was like, well, are people gonna think this or that? Right. Like it's that it's just kind of a taboo thing to say. Uh, yeah. You know, sex addict, you just don't say things like that, right? What if somebody's listening to this and they have somebody in their life that clearly has an issue with sex addiction? How do you approach that with somebody? Because it's a little different than showing them the empirical data of like, you're drinking too much, you're right, you know, that's a little clear. How, how does somebody go about having starting to have that conversation with somebody? Oh, I think that would be very tricky because of the issue of shame. You know, so many sex addicts, double lives are so cloaked in that, you know, do not enter, you know, I will hide this at all costs um, kind of mentality um, that someone approaching them from the outside to potentially, you know, help them or even offer just resources. Um I expect would be met with quite a bit of denial <laughs> um, unless it was an extremely trusting relationship. Um, but you got to understand that even between husbands and wives, this is such a 
a thorny, thorny issue, um, you know, and some people would rather, you know, separate and divorce rather than really confront this as a couple or, um, you know, for one partner to really confront the other. Um, and, you know, I mean, if you were, though, to, 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 you know, have somebody in your life who you really saw this was an issue and wanted to help them, um, you know, just sort of that gentle hands off approach of, if you want to talk about it or talk about getting help, like I'm here, you, we don't even have to go any further, you know, you can look at you, you can look at me, or look towards me to help you find resources or treatment or therapists, um, just and basically, like, here I am, you know, um, I'm happy to help if I can, but putting the pressure on, oof, that's just, that's not going to, you know, do anything, but probably make the addict just flee. Emily, final thoughts here. Uh, if somebody's listening to this and they're thinking, wow, Emily is talking about me. I, I tend to have these patterns, think this way, involved in this activity, but I've just kind of shoved it under I haven't, you know, I haven't really ever dealt with this. Maybe they've dealt with other things in their life, but they haven't dealt with this. What are your final thoughts with them about getting help? So I recommend a resource immediately when people come into treatment, which I, you know, feel great about recommending to your um, listeners and viewers. There is a psychologist named Patrick Carnes, and he has been writing about and researching sex addiction since I think the early 70s. And he is really just a pioneer in this field. I think he was really the first to put a name to it. And he has written so many books and, you know, treatment curriculums for therapists. He has sort of a series of treatment centers out in Arizona. But anyway, if someone just wants to, you know, find a point of connection and understanding and education, there's a book um, written by Patrick Carnes called Don't Call It Love, Understanding Sex Addiction, which is wonderful, um, really lays it out. Um, and then another one called Out of the Shadows. Um, again, these are both by Dr. Patrick Carnes. And, you know, he talks about 12 step, he talks about finding um, appropriate professional help. Um, you know, but I think you need to understand too, and this is why I specialize in addiction, is a lot of general therapists are just not prepared to, um, you know, really treat effectively this issue. They might, um, you know, sort of back away out of their own, you know, sort of ickiness issues um, or, you know, personal issues with sex. They might just not be well versed about, you know, what really makes a good recovery if they're not addicts or don't know addicts um, in general. Right. So it is really, really important to find the right treatment provider, someone who really, you know, um, has worked with this condition before and um, can be extremely compassionate, understanding, accepting, but also challenge them in the right way. So great. Emily Sussman, this has been a really a phenomenal episode. Uh, a lot of education, a lot of understanding about what this is, a lot of clarity. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Can I just add one more thing? Um, Absolutely. Yeah. So I published a book last summer. It's called The Addict's Guide to Recovery. Um, you can find it on Amazon, um, you know, most uh, online retailers, both in Kindle and print. Um, and the reason that I'm, you know, talking about it right now is I wrote it for every kind of addict. Um, I wrote it for alcoholics, sex addicts, gamblers, you know, if you can identify with the problem of addiction, um, you know, I, I want you to understand that no matter what the symptoms are, the core issues are the same. And yeah. fortunately, the solutions are the same, right? So, you know, you can check out my book too, if you want that point of understanding and also sort of a jumping off point. I, my middle section is all about sobriety. Um, my first section is all about um, what is addiction? And then finally, what does a recovery program look like? Um, and again, this that. Is universal stuff. This is not just for specific types of addicts. This is for every addict. <laughs> Yeah, I would definitely highly recommend go out and get that book. We're going to put links to how you can get that book and how you can connect with Emily in the show notes and her uh, psychotherapy and coaching practice. Thanks so much for coming on the show, Emily. I really appreciate oh, it. Oh, it's been such a pleasure, Damon. Thank you so much for having me. Sometimes addiction recovery can be a lonely battle, but you don't have to fight it alone. At Recovered Life, we're dedicated to helping you live your best recovered life. And that's why we're inviting you to subscribe to our free weekly newsletter. Every week, we carefully curate exclusive content from leading minds in addiction recovery, mental health, and all things important to the recovery lifestyle. 
Stay in the know with the latest news about addiction and get exclusive invitations to special recovery-focused events and explore insights tailored to support recovery from alcoholism, drug addiction, codependency, disordered eating, dysfunctional family dynamics, gambling, and so much more. With our newsletter, each week becomes an opportunity for growth, healing, and taking a step closer to the life you deserve. Take your first step towards a brighter future today. Go to recoveredlife.us and subscribe for free. Sign up now at recoveredlife.us.